Hey guys, it's Paul, combat veteran, MMA fighter, YouTuber, and today we are checking out SCP Overlord. This is a fan-made uh, like military thriller uh, kind of with a paranormal bend to it. Um, I'm sort of familiar with SCP lore and the foundation, but uh, I'm really excited for this film. It has like 7 million views, right? It's been all over YouTube. It's been blowing up. Uh, YouTube's been suggesting it to me for a while, so I'm excited to take a look. Um, we're going to be doing a part one, and if you guys enjoy it, let me know in the comments below, and I will take a look at uh, doing a part two, three, and four. Now, before we get started, like always, please help me out. Hit the like button. Tell the YouTube algorithm that I am making good stuff here. And of course, if you want to see more of my reviews of films, movies, documentaries, uh, video games, yeah, all other kinds of weird stuff, man, hit subscribe. We'd be glad to have you. You see this is a brand new channel that I'm doing here, and uh, oh, I need all the support that I can get. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's get into it. Everything I'm about to tell you is classified under a level three security clearance and is on a need to know basis. The man you're looking at is Ethan Pender, a figure within a new age religious movement known as the New Transcendentalists. His farmstead has since become a commune for the primary thought leaders with around nine total members. This movement was suspected of organizing chemical attacks all across New England in the early 2010s. Additionally, there have been many strange disappearances loosely associated with the movement. All suspected, nothing confirmed. The past three months, there have been a dozen missing persons across Franklin, Berkshire, and Hampton with no clear offender. But given that this was happening in the Colts' backyard, he and his friends are suspects. Twelve hours ago, the Hampshire County Sheriff's Department received a call. Okay, I gotta say, it is sort of interesting uh, that, you know, everyone in this is, is so uh, young. And, you know, I know in SCP lore, the foundation is a very prestigious kind of multinational NGO that takes a look at uh, securing, containing, and protecting Earth from uh, paranormal activities. Um, it's actually a little bit like the comic, oh my gosh, what was it? There was a comic series about exactly this um, group of people, right, working to detect and contain uh the weird and paranormal activities from Earth. Anyway, if, if you put me put it in the comments if you can remember what I'm talking about. It was really good, and it sort of ended abruptly um, and was canceled probably before it needed to be. Man, it was excellent. Anyway, uh, it's sort of funny to see all these uh, veteran operators looking like they're in their early 20s. But again, it's a fan film, and certainly doing fan service to all these uh, YouTubers is uh, is worth it worthwhile from a man they believe to be in danger the caller refused to directly specify the threat until he handed this picture to the authorities this sighting is presumed to be sarah morrison one of nine missing persons associated with the case our agent within the department informed us the moment this picture was secured and declared a state of emergency requiring immediate action any non-foundation personnel who came into contact or heard mention of this photo has since been detained and given amnestic treatment however the clock is still ticking the Foundation has seen fit to sanction a raid on the Pender Commune. Your objective is to regulate the Commune, assess for any anomalous activity, and secure the property for a containment team. Any persons on site are to be detained or neutralized in accordance with the ROE. Man, okay. I gotta shout him out here. Uh, detained in accordance with the ROE, that's so typical, right? You're gonna have a set rule, set rules of engagement and you're going to already be briefed up on them right there'll be a standard roe and yeah just again little detail gotten right also you can see this is probably one of the most more older experienced actors um and he's delivering his lines in just a little bit of a more authentic way again and, and maybe not maybe this is maybe he's their military advisor um and that's why he's uh, delivering it so well. The other thing is in the U.S. military, I've never heard them refer to recon as a recce. Uh, I've only heard that in the U.K. But again, this is not 
necessarily a U.S. Uh, force, right? This is meant to be a multinational force um, under an NGO. So they could have a totally different set of terminologies, totally different set of radio codes, everything. No anomalous activity is found. You will exfil an RTB. Epsilon 6 will be our primary entry and important team, while our friends from New 7 will provide the outer cordon, short range artillery and air support, including ISR, which comms will be bouncing off of. New okay, shout out again to them for having a really doctrinally sound plan. You notice they had an inner cordon, an outer cordon, and a search element. That's exactly what you should have in doctrine. Also, having I addressing ISR, fires, comms, that's classic military planning, right? It's all there in um, your operations order, right? So the fact that they are understanding that a complete plan is going to address your fires, your comms, your friendly elements, your mission, and your adjacent unit's mission, and your higher unit's mission, right? In fact, I think this even, we could say, covered the situation. So this may be a very abbreviated cut down version of the real US military operations order. So again, pretty good attention to detail. New 7 also fill our QRF alongside specialists. For oh, they're letting them know who the QRF is? Yes, of course you're going to always have a QRF, a, a standby reserve element to respond to a threat that you cannot handle or a need for more manpower. Uh, something else that, again, every mission brief in Afghanistan, we always knew exactly who our QRF was, who we were going to call to spin up to help us out of a jam. And often we were the QRF, right? We were sitting on standby on the base, gear in the trucks, ready to roll out and support someone else who got themselves in a jam. From Zeta 9, U-13, Beta 7, and Lambda 5. As always, Gamma 5 will be running interference to make sure this all stays under the radar. Any mission code ideas, go on the whiteboard in the back. Any questions? Okay, so you see that, man, again, getting the details right. That's the ISR they're watching. So it's ISR, or um, Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance, is the term for what's usually, it's, it's, a, it's, refer, it's drones. Um, it's overhead drones providing that total view of the battlefield and sort of being um, your overwatch for your overwatch. Right, so they're seeing everything. They're so high above that they can see everything that you can't see. Enemy forces maneuvering on you, uh, obstacles up ahead, uh, anything. Right, and they'll uh, be at an elevation that even is well above um, uh, rotary wing aircraft, like you're seeing here. So again, very cool. Getting the details right. Also, how they get this shot? This is a fan film, and they have. Maybe they're using B-roll of these helicopters infilling. Oh, did you see the little, um, uh, like, sparkling effects on the people? That is their IR glint tape bouncing off of um, probably IR Illum from... The, or, or it could be that, or it could be on the back of their helmets. They may have beacons that are flashing. Um, just again, to help identify friend from foe, because someone's going to be sitting, watching the camera feed from your drone, usually at your headquarters element, and will relay intelligence to the team lead on the ground. So you want to make sure you've got, again, I, I think it is their IR beacons. Um, you want to make sure that you can know if you say, okay, Friendlies are here, here, and here, and enemy are here, here, and here. Especially, as you can see, in thermals, it's really hard to distinguish, uh, you know, uniform characteristics. Archangel, the Helios Scepter is away. Enemy hunting. Okay, pretty cool shot there. Um, I know usually they say don't silhouette yourself against a hill um, because it can be really easy to see uh, a person, the outline of a person on a ridge line like that. Um, but that's a pretty minor detail, and frankly, uh, that's a pretty cool shot. Probably worth sacrificing the uh, the uh, tactical realism for some cinematography. <laughs>
All right, let's be a Geardo a little bit. Uh, so what's interesting is that one, he and uh, I assume the rest of the team have on gas masks, right? And if you were, of course, dealing with paranormal activity, um, you really would want to just treat every environment like it may be hazardous uh, or, or have hazardous breathable gases, right? And that would be a common sense mitigation. Also, right, you can see he's running, he's wearing flannel and jeans, which I, I, I know I've heard of that, right? I've seen it a lot of like uh, U.S. special agents will run like flannel and jeans type setups prior to their raids or operations. Um, I don't know if a dedicated tactical team would necessarily want that. Um, jeans are not optimal for tactical environments like this, especially where presumably they're infilling and then if walking a good distance, you know, five, six, seven miles to the target, right? Because you don't want your target to see helicopters landing 500 meters away. Um, and if you've got to traverse through some woods, jeans are like a pretty terrible option. Um, the fabric is not ripstop, so a little tear will keep tearing. Uh, because they're cotton, they absorb water and mud and never really dry out. Um, they're not anything repellent. Uh, and again, jeans are cut a little differently, especially jeans nowadays that are like fashion items. They don't necessarily give you like the full mobility that you might get from, uh, say, the very baggy cut of uniform pants or even tactical, uh, the tactical khakis that you get from like 5'11 and stuff. And of course, jeans are flammable, right? Cotton. So if you were to encounter... Um, you know, some sort of flammable explosive device, uh, there's a chance that that could catch on fire. Whereas again, most modern uniforms are somewhat flame retardant. Dropping the chem light, yep. That's exactly uh, a real thing. You would always carry chem lights. Can't say I've ever used them to gauge a distance down a hole, but as a cheap, easy form of illumination or signaling. That's the other thing that chem lights are great for, is helping signal. Um, again, when I was deployed, it was before the days of the IR beacon on the back of the helmet. And so we would actually carry IR chem lights, usually in our vehicles, so that in an emergency, if we had to tag ourselves as friendly, we would stick those IR chem lights on ourselves, stick them in the helmet band, stick them on the vehicle, wherever you had to, and you know they wouldn't give away your position, but to a pilot overhead looking through thermals, they would see a big, bright IR chem light burning, um, marking your position. Klinsky, anything. Scepter 1 1 to Helios. We passed Ambrose. No sign of the civilian. Just a hole here now. Uh, no way to determine the depth. Over. Roger that 1 1. Proceed to next objective. Over. We'll go, Helios. 1 1 out. They're using proper radio protocols, right? They don't say, uh, you know. Well, they're not. They're, there's no Roger Wilco, right? Roger or Wilco. They sort of mean the same thing. Uh, well, Roger is saying, like, I hear you. Wilco is like, we'll comply. Like, I have received your order and we'll follow it. Um, so Roger would be things like receiving information. Someone would tell you, hey, ISR shows uh, three dismounts 100 meters north of your location. That's not an order. You would just go Roger. Whereas if they said, hey, proceed to intercept these dismounts 100 meters north of your location and, and get an identification of who they are, you would go Wilco. Again, getting it right. I'm all right, should have a good time with that. UGV should have picked this shit up way before we got here. Command's got some fucking nerve asking us to stick your nose in there. It comes with the territory. That's what we're here to do, and we're gonna do it. Part of the job. I can see it, you know? You getting snatched up? I got of a fucking movie? Yeah, but, I mean, come on, it's never like that. Hold out your hand. I'm telling you, Cicero. Another day at the office. About what? Okay. 
Also a nice touch that they uh, took the time to get right. Even though it's daylight, because they don't know how long this raid could last, they're carrying their nods. And of course the best place to carry the nods is in the designed nod carrier right over your head. Um, also makes sense because you never really know, and if you think you're going to have to uh, infiltrate a building or uh, a tunnel, right, having the ability to uh, drop your night vision on is going to be pretty essential. So again, something that a real um, tactical folks would make sure they bring. We would always have, again, we had the clip in, clip out nods, so we would just keep them in our bags. You know, we had a standard like 24 hour loadout, and it would be like your nods, your spare batteries, two bottles of water, your weapons, maybe your weapons cleaning kit or like a, fi a kit to like fix your weapon, um, and like, you know, some food, some snacks, um, just enough to like survive if you're mission was you know missions that were supposed to be like eight hours we'd plan for 24 right if we were planning on a 24-hour mission we would bring stuff to sustain ourselves for 72 and if we were planning a 72-hour mission we would things would get a little weirder we'd have like a dedicated resupply plan um we'd work with the company headquarters to be to actually like pre-position like resupply stuff um you know sometimes if we were going really remote we'd actually pre-plan what they call speed balls which are uh, basically pallets of supplies, like everything you would need to fight. So ammo, a little bit of food, fuel for your vehicles, spare batteries for your comms, right? All packed up, palletized so that a helicopter can just snatch it up and drop it off right for you and get out. Um, and an easy way to resupply if you're somewhere way, way, way remote and sort of stuck out there longer than you thought. Any ideas on this shit? Maybe we're being invaded. Raji's learned to dig to America. Hey, Kolinsky, what's the scoop? Hmm? Can I get back to you about it? What, the hole? Nothing yet. Well, you're smart, right? What's your take on it? I don't have one. We don't know enough. Any conclusion I would jump to would just be conjecture. Yeah, I kind of think you. If there's an answer, it's in that commune. We'll figure it out. Always do. Yeah, it's helping. What about you, Reyes? What do you think? I think you talk too much. Come on, sending some mole rats over to have a look at it. Come on, let's get back in formation. Watch your step, boys. Yeah, a little interested about the, 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 like, tactical chill conversation. Um, you know, they're obviously at the hole. They obviously think that there's some evidence of hostile activity, and they're just kind of chilling at it. Um, what was realistic was that when they had the one person searching the hole and his battle buddies were around him providing security, I assume some were providing outward security and some were covering him to make sure nothing snuck up on him as he investigated that, that hole. Uh, but maybe their outer cordon is already placed and that's why they're a little chill here. Um, that would be my guess. That's why I would be like chilling in this like chill, like low... Low, low tactical, low threat sort of posture. Interesting. Again, it's hard to really assess the tactics because I don't have a great sense of the lay of the land. Um, if they are like on this guy's farm commune compound, then like, yes, walking in line abreast, pushing across would be logical, right? Because they're looking for, let's say, a body or a person or, or evidence of paranormal activity. So you'd want to be online pushing across this area, right? So that it's easy to like search for things. Um, in contrast, normally when you move through terrain, you are going to be more in a wedge formation, um, which can narrow to a file if the terrain is really tight. Um, so I don't know if that's, so if I was crossing through like a low river, one, I wouldn't cross through a low river if I could avoid it, uh, because why get your feet soaked, right? And, and risk getting, you know, uh, uh, trench foot or, or whatever gnarly stuff happening to your feet. Um, but I would probably, if I was in this terrain, I'd have my guys go to a ranger file um, just so we could traverse the river easily because you don't know what's below the surface, right? Um, even something stupid like a like an extra deep hole 
could twist an ankle, then you're stuck sitting there waiting. You got to Kazvac your buddy. It's a silly reason to have your mission go go off time. So yeah, I would just be like Ranger file. Everybody walks the river the same way. Oh yeah, that flat open area. Yeah, definitely would go to a wedge formation. Oh, which they have actually. Look, see, they're at an angle. They've transitioned to a wedge. Pfft, dude, this, they've got some tactical advisor who is all over it. Okay, it was probably a security halt, right? Maybe checking their location, calling it in, then getting back on. There's the ranger file now. Yeah, yeah, they're getting it, man. They get it. They get it. I think Chambers and Meadville, I don't think they may be towns, but if they may also be phase lines. So phase lines are a term for um, helping to coordinate your operation. So when you pass, so I'd say, hey, we've just passed phase line Meadville, and that might tell your outer cordon that it's time for them to start moving to get into position. Or maybe, hey, Mead, you know, hey, just past phase line chambers. Maybe that's queuing up your ISR to get on station. Um, you know, it could be it could be anything. But usually, you use phase lines instead of hard times to help pace an operation and make sure everyone is moving in synchronization. check that out one that's exactly how isr works right you've got somebody at command they are looking at the objective making sure that nobody is coming out of that house but look at the formation that's really pretty good um you know they've got the triangle in the center i would normally do it as two teams um i would have a, a primary wedge and then a secondary wedge like following behind maybe at an angle um but the fact that they know that they're in the formation, they're in an open area, and they're spaced out appropriately for that formation, for that area, that terrain, says that their tactics are on point. And there's the IR beacons. So here's what's interesting. That's actually a, a, a totally real thing. We used to take pictures of everything because the analysts back at headquarters, right, or back at our battalion would uh, really be able to derive a lot of good intel from even just routine pictures, right? Because they want, you know, again, someone might do analysis of that symbol or the materials it's made out of or anything, right? And the problem, you know, 
one, 10 years ago, we didn't have phones. Uh, we didn't have the, uh, the iPhone was not all pervasive, but two, a digital camera, it doesn't have Bluetooth. It doesn't have Wi-Fi. It doesn't have GPS, right? It's a totally self-contained apparatus. And that is actually a tactical advantage. If you believe that the enemy could, um, detect your cameras, um, again, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, electronics, GPS. So a simple, you know, 10 year old connects to nothing, just battery powered, uh, camera actually is a, a, a tactical asset. Also got to say, uh, I think, I believe that was maybe a uh, shout out to, I want to say Christopher Nolan or Dennis Vil Vilvenu. The, the dark, darkened environment, uh, main character in the foreground and in the background, uh, an effigy burns. I, w I want to say, can somebody let me know in the comments? There's definitely an iconic movie that that is referencing, an iconic scene. And if you can help me remember it, it would be awesome. Thank you. Okay, again, this is really dense. Um, I understand for cinematography reasons, seeing the team emerge. And the tactical move is correct, where you would go as the terrain opens up, your formation opens up with it. Um, so again, I won't fault them because I can tell the director really wanted to shoot this pretty cool shot of the team emerging from the uh, uh, smoke and from the jungle, or the forest, excuse me. Also, a lot of guys wearing jeans. This is Sector 1-1. One, one. We've passed Poe. We've got eyes on multiple humanoid anomalies floating above the trees at the north side of the property. Please advise. Over. Roger, 1-1. One, one. Maintain your course. The anomalies can be dealt with by QRF or the containment team after you've investigated the property. Over. Understood. 1-1 one, one out. We good to go? Affirmative. Get your men in position. Fuck you. Yeah. Sector 2, we're go ahead for intercordon. Weapons free. Over. Hey, that's exactly how that sort of conversation would go, right? He, Vaz is the team lead, right? He gets the order. They are set. Um, I would not call weapons free. Maybe maybe that's their way of saying that, like, hey, we are in on the objective. Um, there's no civilians around. But you wouldn't call weapons free because your friendlies are going to go searching in that house. So your weapons aren't free. You absolutely have to really carefully... Uh, uh, disidentify or distinguish friend from foe when that search team enters. Uh, definitely wouldn't want my inner cordon to go weapons free, but you know, they're freer than they were, I guess. But be afraid of the truly free. That's why. One, 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 in position, over. Just Roger, two, one. Sector one moving in for entry, over. To be strung up like the rest. But I know you all are somewhat anxious. Okay, I will say, all right, let's let let's them get in position here. Often when we've attained something Okay, I do sort of wonder, because, like, there's a glass pane on that door. So anybody that's looking through the door is going to see them coming up. So I wonder if stacking on the left side of the door like that is, is the best call. Like I, And, again, you would have to be a really well-trained team to 
know like, okay, if the doorway is transparent, we have a different protocol. Um, but, you know, it, it's still, maybe it's not. But still, they've gotten the basic tactics right, which is coming up the stairs, stack on the door, ready to go. You see the man on the right is going to be their breach, their breaching, breacher. Um, and he's going to, you know, maybe just open the door, maybe kick the door open, maybe shotgun the hinges, but somehow get the door ready to be opened. He'll kick it open. His team will come in from the left, enter and clear the building, and the trail man will come in. Uh, after having probably, if, like, he had to open it with a shotgun or a crowbar, he'll shoulder the crowbar or shotgun, get up his primary weapon, and join the stack, right? But we are at 9.52, right? We're about a quarter of the way through. So far, I'm so impressed. They definitely, uh, you know, I hope their Kickstarter paid their military advisor quite a bit. They certainly listened to them, um, and again, for non-actors, uh, this is pretty incredible. Um, all right, guys, if you enjoyed this, of course, be sure to hit the like button and let me know in the comments below if you want me to check out the next episode. And of course, hit subscribe for more of my takes on video games, films, movies, documentaries, you name it. And until next time, I will see you guys later.